Uh, my name is Sarah McKinstry Brown, and I'm going to be reading today from my um, first full length collection, Cradling Monsoons, winner of the 2011 Book Award, which I have to say because. It's exciting. Um, I've been in Omaha since July of 2002, so I've been here almost 10 years. Uh, I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where I got my undergraduate degree in creative writing. I also was lucky enough to study at the University of Sheffield, England for a year. Um, I got my master's degree from the University of Nebraska uh, low residency MFA program. And uh, how I ended up in Omaha is a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Uh, after I graduated from college, I was planning on going to Puerto Rico. Who knows why? It just seemed like a good idea. My mother didn't think it was a good idea, but I thought it was a good idea. I had my plane ticket. Um, I sold much of what I owned in preparation for that. Uh, and then 9-11 happened. Um, I was supposed to be flying out of New York City and I'd planned to take a train from Albuquerque to New York City. 9-11 happened so that pushed my plans back um, because things were so uncertain uh, at that time. But also after watching those towers go down over and over I had this um, sort of awakening and I think all of us became more aware of our mortality in those moments. and. Um, <clears throat> I thought to myself, okay, if I die tomorrow, what do I want to be doing? <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to be in Puerto Rico. I want to be reading my poetry. So I decided I was going to sell off the rest of my belongings, but what I could fit in one suitcase, and uh, put together a poetry tour across the country. And one of my stops ended up being in Omaha, Nebraska, where I met uh, my now husband, uh, Matt Mason, the poet. He booked my show, and then he sort of lured me here, so. I, Nebraska and the Plains have absolutely influenced my writing, if for no other reason than the openness of the landscape. Uh, I remember driving from Chicago to Omaha before I moved here with uh, Matt Mason before he was my husband, and he was um, driving me back to Omaha from a show I had done in Chicago, and I looked out the window as we were driving, and I thought if I didn't know where I was and I saw that sky, I would think I was in New Mexico, which is where I'm from, um, and it just struck me how many similarities there are between the, the plains uh, and the southwest part of the country. Obviously, the mountains aren't here, but there's this openness, and for me, um, visual space translates as psychological space, which then gives me um, creative space and I'm just a person that really needs um, quiet and space to think. This is something that I just discovered over the last couple of years um, which is how much my parents influenced me as a writer and not in very obvious ways they weren't writers themselves mm -hmm. but my mom um, was a nurse who worked with uh, drug and alcohol uh, abuse, people who are suffering or dealing with drug and alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. And she devoted her life to, uh, to that, to treating these types of people. And so um, whenever we were in a grocery store when I was growing up or a parking lot or, you know, on our way to church or wherever we might be, if there was a down and out looking person, you know, they would call, they would know my mother by name and call out, hey, Susan. Mm -hmm. And so there was something about my mom being connected to this sort of what, what is normally an invisible population or a population mm -hmm. that we don't normally look at. So there was that connection which I, which I think sort of taught me about empathy and observing. Um, my mom was a nurse and she did work with people who um, were up against a lot. <clears throat> And so she always noticed, I think because she was always on her feet, she always noticed if people had good, comfortable shoes or not. And it really bothered her if, if we were somewhere and she saw someone didn't have a good pair of shoes. So I think that was really kind of the beginnings of learning about sort of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, mm -hmm. being empathetic, observing. And those are all the things I think you need to be a good human being and, and a good writer. And then my dad, um, he's a lover of music. And um, I have a poem called Music Appreciation 101 that I'll be reading today um, where I reference an, an image of my father putting a needle on a turntable and getting ready to play an album, which is just an image that's just very strong in my mind when I think of my, my dad. And um, 
a couple of years ago, I started thinking about how I fell in love with poetry because of the music of the language and how I was really surrounded by music as a child because of my father. So my mom and dad have been very significant, I think, in planting that, the seeds for creativity and poetry in my life. I can say when I was 19 years old, I stumbled across a poetry slam in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Just by accident, I happened to wander into a coffee shop where the Albuquerque Poetry Slam was performing. And what I saw was so dynamic. Um, they were doing a group piece, and they were moving around on stage, and there were all these voices. And at one point, one of the poets pretended to get into a phone booth and call God and have a conversation. And that was just so exciting to me. I didn't know that poetry could be that or do that. And um, I, I think I was just about to turn, I think I was just about to turn 19. And so as a gift to myself, I decided I was going to go to every single poetry reading that I could for that month. And so that planted the seed, and that's when I really started seriously writing every night uh, in a little journal. And it was horrible, horrible stuff. Thank God I didn't keep it, but <laughs> that was the beginning. I, I, do, I do find that if I don't, if I am not writing, um, I do feel just sort of anxious and frustrated and agitated, which isn't good for my marriage <laughs> or my home life. No. So I really try to find time to write. It, it gets more and more difficult as life gets more complicated and busy. But I've also found um, sort of wonderfully enough is that um, now that I've begun teaching, I teach creative writing at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, um, figuring out ways to talk about writing and communicate ideas about writing has become a really great creative outlet for me. And so um, that's where a lot of my creative energy is going right now. And I'm OK with that, because it's really exciting and I'm learning a lot. I'm really intensely preoccupied, for better or for worse, with human relationships. Um, I, I get a lot of my material or ideas, usually when I'm going for long walks, it'll just start with a phrase or an image, but it's almost always triggered by some sort of interaction I've seen between people or some interaction I've had in the past or um, something my daughter might have said. My, my seven-year-old um, a few months ago said this great thing. She was crying and crying because she was so worried. And she said, I keep collecting worries. I can't stop collecting worries. And I thought, oh, that's really poetic. And I told my husband about it, who's a writer, too. And he said, I'm, oh, I'm going to use that in a poem. And I said, don't you wait. I was going to use that in a poem. But uh, so I'm just sort of interested in the human experience and emotion and how we interact and relate um, and all that, so. Cool. Yeah, the themes that keep returning in my writing, I, I think, are just um, really, yeah, revolve around human relationships and, and trying to figure out um, who we are and what these relationships mean. And um, my, my, the book, Cradling Monsoons, is very much preoccupied with um, um, me trying to come to terms with uh, finding a way to follow my uh, passion as a writer, but also um, still stay rooted and ground grounded enough to be a mother and a wife, and because those are two very different existences. One's very selfish and sort of want to go off on your own in your mind or literally, physically, and the other one's about really being rooted. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm also just. My work is preoccupied as well with looking at other women artists, visual um, or writers, um, because I'm just sort of interested in how, as women artists, we come to terms with um, existing in the domestic realm, hopefully successfully, but then also not letting that quelch the fire and the artist and the passion. I've not figured it out, but if I do, I'll make lots of money, I'm sure. <laughs> So if there's a particular style or voice in my writing, I would say it's um, conversational and, and intimate, I would hope. I, I, f I want people to feel when they're reading my poems like we're in the same room together. And maybe it's late at night, because that's when people get very honest. <laughs> um, but I, so I very conversational, um, a sense of intimacy, and then a sense of, of exploration, and a sense of honesty, I hope. And so I just want, I really long for that connection with the reader. That's such an interesting question. Do I write for a certain audience? I. 
some part of me always has my 19 year old self in the back of my mind and I'm not sure maybe it's time to outgrow that <laughs> um, but I'm so um, preoccupied with reaching younger people or finding an image or a moment um, that can set that spark or that excitement or maybe sort of plant that seed for being interested in writing. Uh, so I just, I, I think I still have that part of me that maybe not, maybe I shouldn't say my 19 year old self because that makes it sound like it's about being 19 and sort of the immaturity, but, I, but I, I think the point of it is I'm always looking to reach that person who didn't know that they could love poetry or didn't know that they wanted to write or didn't know that there would be anything that was written for them or that they could connect to. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just always thinking about that excitement that brought me to it, of the, the imagery and the creativity and the ideas. I think a big part of becoming uh, successful at writing or anything is learning how to respect your voice, who you are, and how you work. I spent many years, wasted many years, thinking, well, that one time when I went to go see Billy Collins read, he said, I always tell my students, you'll never be a great writer if you don't wake up and write down that line that came into your head in the middle of the night. Well, when you have two, you know, when you have a newborn and <laughs> have to be at work in the morning and, you know, um, maybe you don't always get up and write it down. But so I thought, well, I'm never going to be a great writer. Billy Collins told me so because I don't get up in the middle. You know, and then I remember reading Anne Lamont had advice um, in one of her books and she said nothing good happens after nine o'clock at night don't try to write at nine o'clock at night well sometimes that would be the only time that I have to write and still so you know and um, so I think you have to take all of that with a grain of salt and then really just look at your own life and figure out what you need to write how you work so that you can respect that and um, there's a great quote by Thomas Merton who's a Trappist monk and also a poet and um, one of my favorite quotes of his I can't can't reference it directly, but basically he said, you know, many um, poets never become great poets for the same reason that many men never become saints. They never succeed in being themselves. So I think you really need to figure out how to succeed in being yourself, and also you have to define success on your own. You can't look at other people's definitions of success, and your definition of sec success has to evolve as you evolve and change. When I first was writing, I remember being in a bar in Dublin on New Year's Eve when I was studying in Sheffield and, you know, having a little too much to drink and telling this stranger next to me, I'm going to be famous, I'm going to be a famous writer, and everyone's going to know my name, you know, youth, right? I think I was 20 years old. And, uh, you know, and now it's, you know, it's not about that. For me, success is, you know, writing a great poem that someone connects with, maybe just one poem. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John A. James Reading Series. We're really excited that this reading series has been in existence for more than 25 years, and that this is the 201st reading. And I've been looking forward to the 200 for so long, it's just really fun to say the 201st reading, too. I appreciate your being here today. We are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, it is a special collection dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. This is a representative collection of more than 13,000 volume over here, and they're written by more than 3,000 Nebraska authors. We do have other things too, like information files, magazines, pictures, manuscripts, um, artwork, and things that are around the room that you can see if you take a look. Um, I just want to mention too that the Heritage Room is not supported by tax dollars, your tax dollars. It is supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, and we would also like to thank the NLHA for the endowment that was established a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. We'd also like to thank those who contributed to the Heritage Room Endowment Fund during our recent campaign. We invite you to visit the Heritage Room during our regular public service hours. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3, and on Sunday from 2 to 5. 
and actually we're open right now because it is a little after two o'clock and um, we're having this reading during the the open hours on Sunday so and I'm glad you're here again the Ames readings are filmed by Five City TV. We have a couple of cameras around the room. Um, if you're not in the Heritage Room today in person watching this, I just want you to know that we're on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library, 14th and N Streets in downtown Lincoln. And that the Ames readings are currently held on the third Sunday of the month at two o'clock. Our reader today is Sarah McKinstry Brown. Sarah was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but I believe she's lived in Omaha for the last 10 years or so. She has degrees in English and in the fine arts and she might tell you a little bit more about that too. She does have a poem which kind of caught my attention I think called Music Appreciation 101 and it was published in Nebraska Presence that was published several, several years ago. Nebraska Presence, an anthology of poetry that was published by Backwater Press. And so I believe you may hear that too today. She mentioned that. Um, she's won several awards recently, the Academy of American Poets Prize and the Blue Light Book Award in 2010, as well as the Nebraska Book Award for Poetry in 2011 for her book, Cradling Monsoons which was published in 2010, and it was published by Blue Light Press. We're very happy to have Sarah with us here today, and I would, I'd appreciate it if you'd help me show appreciation for her to be here today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you hear me? That's the first most important part. Yes, you can hear me. OK. Um, thank you, Meredith. And um, thank you all for being here. I know it's a beautiful day. <laughs> and we have to take advantage of those in January. So I know you don't have to be here listening to poetry. So I'll try to make it worth your while. Um, and how can I not with Willa Cather to my right? <laughs> and and I have followed Ted Kuzer. He just read here last month. So. Um, it's just a real honor and a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm going to be reading from my uh, first full-length collection, um, Cradling Monsoons. And as you'll hear um, sort of throughout, but particularly in the poems that I begin with, there's this intense preoccupation with um, motherhood and marriage and domesticity and trying to figure it all out. And I felt very self-conscious about that as I was putting this collection together. Um, but I had this realization, which was that it's um, still something that uh, many women are struggling with is how do we pursue our calling as artists, but also how do we remain rooted and, and, and stay true to ourselves as um, wives, mothers, partners, whatever it might be. And, and what, even if you don't have a family, if you are an artist, I think there's that sense of feeling that pull to go out and explore. And even if you're not doing it physically, you still feel that pull in your imagination. You know, you're always somewhere else, even when you're at home. <laughs> you're always somewhere else in your mind when you're writing. But you also need to be rooted. And, and sort of how do we make those two existences come together and sing? So that's what this collection um, is intensely preoccupied with, and I'm, I'm just going to own it. <laughs> and as, a, as I've heard, uh, I, I don't, can't remember who said it, but if you can't pronounce a word, just say it loudly. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm saying it loudly. So the first poem um, I'm going to read is called um, The Folgers Commercial, and it's just kind of a, a fun poem. The Folgers Commercial. I'm folding laundry when the music kicks in. I look up at the television. Of course it's early in the morning. Of course the brother just away at college made it home just in time for his sister's birthday. Coffee brewing. His younger sister takes the bow off the gift her brother brought her, sticks it over his heart, says, you're my present this year. And I fight back tears, though it's not even good coffee, and these actors are working me with ropes and pulleys. My daughter toddles into the living room. I blame her. That big head, those even bigger eyes, surprised to be breathing, delighted with the air. She raises her arms up, up, 
And of course, the mom and dad come downstairs to find their grown son and daughter sharing a cup of coffee. The best part of waking up. And now I'm crying, weeping, really. It's the red bow, the brother, the sister, the yellow daisies on our counter my husband bought me just because. It's the boy they pulled from the river this morning, our lilacs budding, last night's footage of another woman keening in the rubble, all that music so determined to ruin me. So I've talked about that that poem before and how becoming a mother, I just didn't expect at all how much my sort of the wires would be stripped, you know, and I'd just be crying at the drop of a hat and so easily manipulated. And I would go out to have coffee and I would hear, you know, the milk steamers and they steam the milk. And I would think, there's a baby crying. That's a baby. Everything sounded like a baby crying. Everybody needed me, <laughs> you know, and so um, that, that poem sort of grew out of that. Um, this next piece is called um, What He Brings Me, and it's, um, it's a bit of a, a love poem. Um, it's about um, when I had uh, my first daughter, my husband, who's a poet as well, Matt Mason, he was experiencing a huge boost in his career as a writer. So he was traveling just a ton, and I was in our little basement apartment with the baby, and my husband was going off doing all these wonderful things, and then he'd come home, and I'd say, well, you know, what did you have to eat, you know? Oh, just a burger. What was on it? You know, I was just really sort of, I felt like I was in lockdown. Tell me about the world. Tell me what's going on out there. So this is called What He Brings Me. Sometimes it's a rose or an armful of groceries. Tonight, he walks through the front door with a good story. The key that promises to release me from this small country where the emperor is our baby and the mother tongue, mommy. Our daughter in bed, we set sail on the couch. Voices hushed, bare feet on the sands of her sleep. My husband, with lungs full as a boy's pockets after his first afternoon at the beach, tells me about his day. Each word, a piece of blue glass held up to the light. Every, you should have seen it, an iridescent shell placed in my palm. This is how the night breaks open. He puts his lips against mine, and I hear ocean. Um, the next two poems I'm going to read um, have to deal with the, um, when I was pregnant with my first daughter, it, the first poem is about being pregnant with my first daughter, and the second poem is about being pregnant with my second daughter, and you'll hear the switch in tone or attitude or feeling. So this is when the first baby was coming, and it was all going to be so easy. It's called In the Sixth Month. In the sixth month, your inner ear has fully formed. You can hear now. I've heard of mothers playing their unborn babies, Bach and Mozart, because classical music makes the brain's spatial connections arc toward one another like the fingertips of Adam and God on the ceiling of the Sistine. I've played no such music for you, and maybe someday when the boy you pine for majors in architecture or when your brain goes cloudy as you stare at your pop quiz in geometry, you will hold this against me. The truth is, I can't bear to wear headphones on my stomach, won't force you to sit in the front row seat of your mother, the auditorium, while Pachelbel's cannon fires off the synapses of your brain. For the same reason, I can't bring myself to have your father recite French or fractions into my belly. No sonata or tongue or equation could teach us what we are learning already. That to be human is to be heavy, to carry more than one heart inside of you. And the poem actually continues in the book, but I've found more and more that I like leaving it right there. 
Um, so the next poem is um, when I was pregnant with the second daughter after I'd realized all the terrible mistakes I was going to make. <clears throat> and this is called After the Ultrasound, Week 12. You should know your big sister is prone to stomping small things. Not yet two inches long, you're safe for now. Still, before your first breath, I'd like to say I'm sorry for yelling, for forgetting to pick you up from school, for the Coca-Cola Slurpee you can't have, for FM radio split atoms, American cheese, and the ozone hanging over you like a sieve. Sorry for the 5, 6, and 10 o'clock news and for fattening you up with Disney. I'm sorry for 13, yellow number 5, and mandatory pep rallies. I'm sorry for your first French kiss, for laugh tracks, improvised explosive devices, and standardized aptitude tests. Sorry for footnotes, specifically Ulysses for depleted uranium, Sunday nights, and Eleanor Rigby playing on Muzak in Applebee's. God help us. Someday you'll come across pictures of this ultrasound and of Saturn's rings. I'd hoped more of this world would be left to your imagining. <clears throat> Um, this next piece is called um, After 13 Months of Searching, the girl's body is found five miles from our house. Um, there was a little girl who went missing named Amber Harris. I'm sure you're familiar. Her picture was all over um, the news for a long time. And um, her body was, was found, and it was uh, so close to where I live, and I just couldn't escape. That's something that I think about a lot just in general, and then in my work is sort of we're sitting here listening to, to poems, and somewhere someone's suffering terribly, you know, and just I'm always trying to marry the those two existences, and this touches on that a little bit. So after 13 months of searching, the girl's body is found five miles from our house. Nights we sat down to dinner, interlaced our fingers and recited the Lord's Prayer. She was there, taking root, a seed with his seed inside her. Abandoned by the sun, lost in the thick woods of some man's fever, we can't stop looking at our daughters. And when the girl's mother appears on the evening news, distraught but grateful for a body, I understand. From the deep well of our wombs, we draw our daughters up, bring them to our breast, quench a thirst they didn't know they had, saddle them with hunger so they might stay. Let it not be his hands that claimed her. Let it be the tender dirt, the earth slowly awakening to her body as it softens in the sun, preparing her each pearl of larva working to ease the burden, to release her from the body that caught his gaze. Um, I really struggled with that last one. It took me a long time to write, and I kept going back and forth about whether or not I wanted to end that poem on the man's gaze. I didn't know if that felt like giving it back, giving the power back to that person. So if any of you have an answer, maybe you can talk to me afterwards. But um, um, that's something I, I still think about when I read that poem. Um, this next piece is called um, Frida Leaves Diego and Finally Moves to Nebraska. <laughs> um, and you can hear me even, correct? OK. Um, this poem I wrote, um, there was a really bad winter a couple years ago. I'm sure you all remember. And when I think back, I just remember, uh, you know, we, every, every day my husband would check the computer and it would be schools canceled again. And I would be, I'm sure my hair was just, I have wild hair anyways, but I'm sure it was even wilder. And I just remember being in the house wild-eyed with the children and the snow piling higher and higher. and. Um, 
And I, I was feeling a little bitter about my move from Albuquerque to Omaha, if we're going to be honest. And so I thought, well, if I have to be here, you know, Frida's going to have to be here, too. And um, she has such a complicated, this is about the artist Frida Kahlo and her very complicated relationship with her husband, the artist Diego Rivera. And so I thought, you know, she's going to leave him because he doesn't appreciate her. And she's going to come to Nebraska. Why? Because I'm here. So <laughs> um, this is uh, in the voice of Frida Kahlo. So Frida finally leaves Diego and moves to Nebraska. I get up from the kitchen table and walk into the blizzard of my canvas. By dawn, I've painted my little red brick house with its single lit window. If you look closely, you can see me, brush in hand, painting Diego into my womb, the one place where he cannot possibly be hungry. I listen to the second hand tap its pen against the silence. The hourglass is empty. My heart is a little girl banging on a grand piano composed of black keys. Um, that poem was accepted by a, a literary journal that I've been trying to get into for a very long time, and it had already been accepted somewhere else. And when they sent me an email to ask me for the poem, I had to tell them it had already been accepted somewhere else, and then they promptly told me, you must not have read the guidelines because you weren't to simultaneously submit um, this poem to another. So just a little fact about that, and it broke my heart. And it just happened to me again with another recent poem, though, si simultaneous submission were allowed, but I'd been trying to get to this poetry journal, Rattle, which is a great, I'd been trying to get in there for years. And um, six months after I sent them a poem, they sent me an email saying, oh, we love it. Did you, we can't believe, you know, this is so great. And I had to tell them it had already been accepted elsewhere in a place that I hadn't been trying to get into for years. So just a little aside about that one. Okay, um, just let's see what time is it here. Okay, so this next piece is called uh, Comfort Food, and um, it came from watching hours and hours of cooking shows when I was home with a newborn. And we don't have cable, so it was always public TV, so it was always Julia Child, and, um, and um, I just loved her. I mean, talk about someone who just found a passion and followed it and um, was just always true to herself. And I actually saw her weep over a homemade um, fruit tart. She cried after this woman. She went through all the steps from scratch, creating the whole thing, and then she took a bite and she you know, said, oh my, that really is a, a fruit tart to cry over and she was started weeping and I just thought that's just beautiful what a world we live in where someone will cry over a fruit tart because they've got that much passion about food so comfort food I come from a long line of women who insist on cooking up a religion that is more starch than cumin calling on a God who measures blessings most Sunday mornings I can be found on my couch watching cooking shows on TV, searching for a God who is more Julia Child than Charlton Heston. Imagining a heaven that's one big, small kitchen, a place where all our souls will eventually rise to sit around the table and break bread. I can see my grandfather passing the butter to his daughter while God putters around the kitchen in her billowing white apron, measuring and mixing flour, sugar, baking powder. She spills a little salt, pausing to throw some over her shoulder to ward off the bad spirits. And when a handful lands in the night sky, she doesn't bother to sweep it up because she's not the cleaning type. And she knows that all of us down here, whose lives are messy, more accident than recipe, are hungry. Um, I'm going to do just three more. Um, so we were just in heaven cooking with uh, <laughs> cooking with a Julia Child like God, and so um, when I was experiencing some some pretty intense block in my writing program, one of the mentors I was working with, I had just had my second baby, so of course there was block writer's block because I was just kind of a disaster and not sleeping. 
um, she said, well, have you, have you ever done any Heaven and Earth poems? You should try a Heaven and Earth poem. And I said, well, what is, what is that? And she said, well, it's where you, you can just go to heaven and you imagine what heaven would be like, you know, the heaven of bowlers, the heaven of librarians, um, the bus driver's heaven. And um, that was just such a liberating idea. You could shake off all the bounds of, you know, time and space and just go to this place. And it was really helpful for me. And I ended up getting um, three poems out of it three different heaven poems. And so um, this is called, um, I'm going to do my mother's heaven, and then I'm going to do um, the farmer's heaven. <clears throat> my mother's heaven. Morning breaks a yoke in the cast iron pan. Beneath lilac bedspreads in full bloom, she lies sound asleep, sunlight spreading across her face. The nectar of small voices wakes her from that other long dream. Somehow she's slept in, and she rises and unfurls with ease, her spine no longer forcing her to question the ground. She enters her yellow kitchen and finds that the children are children again, and she in her blue robe is famous for pouring juice and buttering toast. Everything torn is mended. The black lab they put to sleep so long ago stretches across the kitchen floor, easing into a dream, his paws pulsing as the coffee percolates, the aroma meandering towards evening. Um, so this is you know what? I'm not going to do the farmer's heaven, I just decided. <laughs> um, I'm going to do uh, Music Appreciation 101, which is a poem I wrote for my father, and it's the poem that opens this book. And um, the only thing you need to know for this poem is that when I reference Kokomo, I'm actually referencing a small town, very small town in Indiana, and not this what the Beach Boys sing about in the early 90s, because that could be confusing. So Kokomo is a little town in Indiana where my father was born. Music Appreciation 101. Dad fell for mom because she looked like Joni Mitchell. Nine shared rent checks and one pregnancy later, my mom came home from the hospital to him going gaga over the new Steely Dan album. I don't blame him. A self-made orphan, he cut down his family tree to build a bridge from Kokomo to San Francisco that's still burning. Before he taught me to ride a bike or throw a left hook, he showed me how to hold a record without touching its face. Without leaving fingerprints, scratches, evidence, my dad's proof that ghosts exist. They come back for birthdays and Christmas. From a distance, he watched me grow into shoes, corsages, suitcases, and greyhound buses. And there's a reason why a record reads like the cross-section of a fallen tree. When my father pulls that album out of its cover, a whole year of his life is right there, circling like kids on bikes and cul-de-sacs, waiting for him to start the turntable, place the needle on the groove, and call them back. Um, that poem, when I'm talking, I teach creative writing at UNO, and when I'm talking to, to my students about imagery, I'm always talking about, you know, think about sound and taste and smells and all that, and I always reference, isn't there a song you hear that you almost can't listen to it because it breaks your heart, because it brings you right back to that moment in time, you know, it's a song or an album, and it's, it, it physically hurts, and um, um, I just think about, think about that when I, when I read that poem. Okay. Um, Two more, and then I'll and then I'll I'll be done. Um, this next poem is um, a newer piece, and it's called "God Is DJ." So there are these reoccurring themes, I guess: heaven, God, God is Julia Child, God is DJ. Um, but this is sort of an homage to my dad as well, who loved music, but was also a DJ. Um, he had all these different jobs. He was a salesman, he drove cabs, and he was a DJ at night. And um, I thought it was so cool when I was younger that I could hear my dad's voice on the radio and I could call in and request songs. And so I was just kind of thinking about my dad when I wrote this poem. And so this is me sort of trying to um, 
call in the voice of a DJ. So maybe you'll have to close your eyes for this one. I don't know. <clears throat> holy, holy, holy. Got a pot of black coffee and I'm smoking this galaxy down to the filter. It's after midnight, y'all, and those stars your mama made you wish on are static. So let's see these phones ignite. You think it's me who saves? Al Green is the one can break and mend in the same breath if I can't stand the rain. Don't make your daddy sit down at the kitchen table and weep into his fists. Then he ain't got no soul to save. Call me. I'll spin anything for you crows building lives out of gum wrappers and barbed wire. Right now I'm going to put the needle down and summon earth, wind, and fire because we both know it's the only salve there is for all the nights you're going to spend burning beneath my moon. This one goes out to all the maniacs in their little pink houses, all you mamas and papas pacing living room floors with your bundled wailings. And for all the rest of y'all, remember, it's the devil want to burden you with wings. It was me set you free with hips and fingertips. Could be your bones is days away from dust. So go on now, get thee to the bedroom, the back seat, the dance floor. Call in those requests. requests. I'll only say no if you ask for stupid shit, like Donna Summer or some little red Corvette. The lines are open. Um, the last piece I'm going to read for you is... Um, called It's Almost Spring, and um, let me just take a pause here. Uh, it takes place in a library, and it is sort of almost spring-like weather we're having, and I wrote this um, in the library in Omaha when it was after that horrible winter, which I just referenced, and there was just the first glimmer of sun and grass, and I could smell things were about to change, and this is the poem that, that came out of it. So thank you so much for listening, and um, this is, it's almost spring. It's almost spring, which means I'm falling in love with everyone. Yesterday it was the man in the produce aisle holding his crying baby. The day before it was the 20-something boy at the coffee shop perfecting his disinterest while he took my order. Today I'm at the library and it's the gentleman sitting across from me working out the crossword on index cards he brought from home so as not to ruin the paper for someone else. Also, there are the children I can't see, but hear, thrumming, gathered in a half circle around the librarian who is reading Pokey the Puppy with great feeling. Maybe I know what you're thinking. Who cares? Or where's the metaphor? Or didn't Billy Collins write this poem like five years ago? <laughs> But it's just that the man's pencil pressed against paper as he works out each letter makes such a great case for silence. And the children, loud as they are, are a fantastic argument for rocking back and forth on your heels, for forgetting to raise your hand, for announcing your hunger or a full bladder. Envious, I watch the gentleman work out the puzzle. He finishes, rises, puts the index cards with all the right words in his front shirt pocket, the paper back in the rack where he found it, the squares empty, and he set free, back out into the sun, his body lighter for having found his way out of this poem and into the breathless morning. Thank you.